So you are all hopefully in the right place. This is the directing panel. Um, how many people out here just by show of hands are interested in directing, want to be directors, are directors? Raise them higher, let's be excited about that. All right, great. Um, well, lucky for you, we have three incredible uh, television directors uh, right here to impart some. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're behind the curtain. <laughs> it's me, Dan. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. um, but let me get, get some intro. I'm Emily, by the way, I'm one of the festival programmers. Thank you so much for being yeah, here. Yay, Emily! Yay! <laughs> This is fun for me because I actually want to direct television. So I'm going to be asking questions that I want to know and glean just as much as you do. So I'm going to do some introductions. Why don't you introduce yourselves? Tell us who you are, some of the Hi. shows you've worked on. Hi, I'm Dave Semmel. Uh, I've worked on a number of pilots, including American Dreams, uh, where I met Tom. Uh, Heroes, I recently did Person of Interest. I just did a new pilot for CBS called. He did two uh, pilots Alex. recently that both got picked up the series. One of the other one called. Slow so uh, And recently I've been doing things like Homeland and American Horror Story and How I Grow. It's been good. So very short sure resume. Um, Tom. Yeah, I'm not following that up. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Uh, I uh, I directed for shows like American Dreams. This guy gave me actually my break right here. Um, but I'm currently on, uh, I'm a producer director on Scandal, which I've directed a number of their episodes, and I've done Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> Are you guys at the yeah, screening? Yeah, uh, you guys follow and, uh, me around. <laughs> you're a big Shondaland guy, like you've yeah. done Grey's Private. I've done uh, Grey's Private, Private and, uh, and, and a lot of other ABC shows, and um, I don't know what else, I'm blanking on That is shows. plenty, I've been, I've, been, sir. I've been fortunate, I've been blessed. <laughs> And Rob Schraub. And I'm Rob Schraub. I, uh, I got my teeth cut on the Sarah Silverman program, which is a show I uh, co-created with Sarah and Dan Harmon. And I uh, was lucky enough to uh, start my directing career on that. And then after that, I did uh, Children's Hospital. Uh, and now I'm working on the, the Mindy Project, uh, Workaholics, and I'm hoping to do some community episodes. So. Yeah. But I'm pretty jealous of you two guys. <laughs> well, I think it's really nice because we have a good kind of diversity of the type of shows that you've directed. Rob, you've done a lot of comedy. You've done a lot of drama. I mean, you've both done a lot of drama, but yours have been a lot more um, with, with, with uh, Homeland and American Horror Story and Heroes. And Buffy as well, you directed on Buffy. A lot of special effects, visual effects to, to, to take on. So a lot of nice diversity we can talk about. Um, you kind of talked about it a little bit just now, but just kind of give us the, the broader story of how you kind of each got into directing. I mean, was it something you always wanted to do? Was it a byproduct of already being in the industry and it just happened? I, uh, I, uh, I was making films when I was a little kid. I'm just the complete cliche. Uh, and I actually came up through editing. Uh, I've always sort of felt that um, it's, it's actually, I love the entire process of filmmaking and if you sort of break it down into the three different um, phases, you know, pre-production, production, and post-production, I've always really enjoyed post-production the most. It really is for me writing on film and it's where you're making the film. Um, but I came up through editing and I've always felt that, that uh, that's a great training and a great background. Uh, you can get caught in the editing room and, and you know, in the editing room, you really find out what you need to make the film. But there's obviously a, a whole other set of issues to figure out how to get that <laughs> stuff on the film. But uh, but that was my background, and I really think it was a great one for directing. What was your first like paid directing job? Do you remember? Uh, paid directing job? Yeah, I, think. I know we do a lot of them that are unpaid, or at least that yeah. happens nowadays. But that first one. Well, you I actually thought before. you were asking me which was the first legal job that I did. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> That too. No, I, I actually, uh, it, was, it was very funny how I fell into sitcoms um, oh. and, and, and for a very short period of time. Um, and I directed uh, one of the original Fox television shows called Duet, which mm -hmm. was a sitcom for Gary Goldberg, who uh, at that time had been doing Family Ties and, oh, okay. and a bunch of other shows. It was, and it was a very short-lived period of time in... Um, in sitcoms, and I went into. Uh, uh, when you say I, you fell into it, like well, how exactly? It was actually very funny. I sort of, I sort of lied. My, I basically lied my way in every job. Here it comes. 
I was, wor- I mean, I'll give you the quick story. I was, I was working uh, on a film down at, uh, what was it at the time called Laird Studios, it's now Culver Studios, and I was uh, working for free as an intern uh, for the prop guy, and uh, he was just an asshole. He, he chained me to the prop cart, and he wouldn't let me kind of walk around and learn, and one day I went to the unit production manager, and I said, hey, is there anybody else I can work for? I mean, I'm thrilled to be here for free, and he said, well, we're kind of we're busy, there's really nobody else. But, um, you know, it's too bad you don't know how to sink dailies because we're, we lost our, our, our apprentice editor. And I said, I totally know how to sink dailies. And he said, well, go over to Building J, and Keith's there, and he'll show you where everything is. And I went over to Building J, and I said, are you Keith? Will you teach me how to sink dailies? <laughs> and it's basically a model for every job I've ever had in Hollywood. <laughs> But I went up in post-production, and, and a woman, and I, it was at a time where things were shifting from shooting on film and, then, and, and, and cutting on film to shooting on film and transferring on tape. And I'd sort of gotten myself in, involved in a technology that, that knew how to do that, and I lied my way into that, too. So somebody had offered me a job in sitcoms. I didn't, even know, I didn't really even know what sitcoms were, frankly. And, um, and, and so I went into that direction for a brief moment, but then sort of steered back towards what I wanted to be doing, which was single camera one hour. Yeah. So Tom, you touched on it, but you were an actor on American Dreams, one of the series mm-hmm. regulars. So what was that like in terms of... He was the dad. <laughs> Jack. 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 Uh, take us through that experience of um, transitioning from acting to directing. Uh, well, I've been, um, I, I started getting interested in directing probably in mid to late 90s. Uh, and I started on shows that I've worked on. Um, I was on Providence for a while. I think that was, I remember that was the first where I, I, I went to the producers and said I'd like to shadow, observe, and uh, potentially get in a position to direct. And they laughed. Uh, <laughs> no, they, they were, uh, that, that's when I started doing that. I, I, that's my first memory of saying I really kind of want to do this because I really enjoy the storytelling aspect and I want to do more than, uh, than you know, doing my three scenes or two scenes in an episode. Uh, and that kind of was the uh, spark that started to do it. Uh, I, I kind of immersed myself into this film program and wanted to, knew that I had to learn the technical side of, of things, with lenses and camera and um, editing film. And, and uh, I, I just thought it was important because I knew I was going to be scrutinized as an actor who wants to direct where uh, Many actors say they want to direct, but they really don't go through the channels and, and uh, education of wanting to understand really what technically happens behind the scene. Uh, so I didn't want to be one of those guys, and I felt I had to sort of overcome that hurdle. Um, and as we got into uh, American Dreams, when I got cast, I remember early on, to this gentleman to my right, I said, I, I'm really interested in directing. And he kind of went, yeah, 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 all right, all right. And, and, uh, <laughs> um, and it, um, I mean, he was generally supportive, but it was more down the line, you know, we'll see if season, if we make it five, six seasons, you might get a crack. But I, uh, I kind of took it upon myself just being wanted to be proactive and wanting to do it because I loved, uh, I loved filmmaking and, and I loved directing. So a buddy of mine had written a short that we tried to sell as a pilot. Uh, and we shot it on weekends when I was doing American Dreams during the first season and uh, pulled some resources from American Dreams. <laughs> As you do. As you do, you got it. Really? <laughs> Which I don't think just came out until just now. Uh, but uh, we put together this, uh, it was a 35 minute uh, pilot and uh, it, I think when Dave and Jonathan uh, saw that, when they finally saw that, he turned around and says, oh, shit, all right, I think you, you might be able to do one. So We actually used to screen all the episodes each week. They were on Sunday nights, and at Friday at lunch, we would screen for the crew. And one day, Tom asked if he could screen his movie. And Jonathan Prince and, and the two, you know, he and I ran running the show, and we sort of looked at each other like, should we let him run this thing? <laughs> and like, I mean, have you seen this thing? I haven't seen this thing. Have you seen this thing? And we showed it, and in the middle of, uh, of the middle of the screening, we looked at each other, we're like, hey, this guy can really direct. He should do our show. <laughs> so he is responsible for, for, and I often, I say that very loudly, that you are... Uh, How far into the run of the show was that first episode for you? Uh, second season, I think it was midway through the second season, yeah. And then... Uh, he and did great, and we then gave... Gave me another one in the third season, yeah. Two more, right? Uh, uh, I think we got canceled before this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did, I did technically, we gave it to him. Yeah. So. Uh, Rob, what about you? Uh, well, you know, I again, I was uh, grew up with a Super 8 camera, doing stop animated dinosaur movies in my dad's garage, and and uh, and then uh, I shot in your dad's garage too. <laughs> 
Wait a minute, now I recognize you. You were in Dino Wars 4. Um, now, I, uh, I, you know, and I, I was always like, I started off in comic books, and I, I did, and, but I always would uh, draw, I, I attacked it more like a storyboard rather than, you know, your typical comic book page. I actually, at the beginning of the book, would say, written, directed by Rob Schraub. I used to say, like, my book was my reel because I couldn't afford a camera. And then when, uh, like, 99 came around and digital cameras came out, I just started shooting stuff and... And then Channel 101, our, our film festival, started happening as just a, a reason for me to shoot a short once a month. And that was like the best education. And uh, when Sarah Silverman's program came around, uh, Comedy Central was like, well, who are we going to get to direct this? And yeah, Harmon and Sarah were like, well, we want Rob. And they were like, well, mm, uh, he's never done anything before. And, uh, yeah, well, you know, that was on the reel. And, uh, <laughs> But they just put their foot down and just said, no, he's going to do it. And I think that's what you need. You need somebody to kind of godfather you and believe in you and just put your foot down uh, and, and, and let you do it. And it turned out really well. And they were happy with how the pilot. And so it was like a foregone conclusion that I would be directing as many of episodes as I possibly could. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what you got to do. You got to like you can't just say, I want to be a director. Will somebody let me a director? Because you're basically saying, hey, can I be in charge? I think I should be in charge. <laughs> Don't you think I should be in charge? Well, everybody wants to be in charge, but could you prove that you can be in charge? And the best way to do it is to show it in front of a bunch of people, and if they respond to it, you're a good director. So You hit on something interesting, um, just in terms of like, I mean, every, you both did about somebody's got to give you that shot. Do you feel like there's a mentorship community within the directing community, or do you feel like that's sort of, in Hollywood, a lost thing? Just kind of. Did you guys get like people like asking you, "Hey, can I shadow you? Do you mind or, or whatever?" I mean, like I, I get that every once in a while. We get it, I get it uh, more in the position that I am now on Scandal. I'm gonna ask I get all, all of you about this. <laughs> uh, I get a lot, and, and we do have uh, ABC has a, uh, I think it was called a diversity program, which is now just their directors program, where uh, they have a lot of uh, directors. They actually pay them, and they go they go out and they place them and shadow them in different. Uh, Different shows with different different people. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a, it's a mentorship per se. Dave, you might want to speak. Well, you know, it, it's it's a it's a it's a great question, and, and and it really is a lot to what you were saying, Rob. About you know, there's this gr great quote I used to have up on my board from Mike Nichols, who said that directing is like sex. You're never quite sure how anybody else does it, and it sort of speaks to the fact that that. Um, Unless, depending what your fetish is, but um, <laughs> you know, it, it's a very lonely position, and and you are in charge, and you're you're you know on the top, so to speak, and and there's there's great reward that comes with it, but it's a very difficult job, and, and the thing that happens in that loneliness position, there's it's you know you're an actor and you sit in the trailer or you sit on set with a bunch of other actors or you're in the, a writer and you're in a writer's room, it's it's not a very com communal job. I do think there's a lot of camaraderie and a lot of support in organizations like the DGA and whatnot, and there is a very strong history of uh, shadowing. But to get that job, it, yeah. it's not like there's a very clear path to it. And frankly, and it's funny, I listened to you, and in some ways I listened to you, and I appreciate the fact that you didn't tell the trailer story, which was also partially how you got the job. But, um, <laughs> but in a certain, and I think about my own story, is that at, at a certain point, you have to kind of take it. Mm -hmm. And you have to say, I'm doing this, and guess what? If I'm not doing that, it, you almost have to make it an undeniable circumstance. Mm -hmm. That there has to be, you know, Hollywood, I mean, look, the reality is it's, it's about leverage. And you have to have a certain leverage to be able to say to somebody who is who is everything about their inertia is to deny you right. that opportunity. It really is. It's easier to say no than to say yes or give somebody a shot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like the best thing to do is just be really proactive. Go out and get a camera and just be shooting shorts and putting them online and just like make it like it. Do it so often that it's it's a habit that you can't stop doing it. And somebody along the line is going to go. And you're, every single time you do it, you're going to get better. And, uh, you know, it's like just go out and do it and show it in front of people. And eventually somebody's going to go, hey, you should do a commercial. You should yeah. do this. You should you should direct well, that. And I think through that, you create your own mentorship with, you know, finding falling into a place. Absolutely. Where yeah. you find someone to latch on to and somebody says, hey, I get this guy's aesthetic. And, or, and you know, I, can, I see something. And, yeah. There's just no, there's no excuse right now because you could just post it on Facebook, post it on Vine, post it on everything. You, know, you said that you started with, with digital cameras. I mean, I'm always sort of jealous of, of people coming up now 
you know, when I was starting, it was literally, I was shooting a Super 8 camera, and I'd have to wash cars to, to, to get enough money to buy a three-minute roll of film. Yeah. And, yes. you know, and, and, and the ability with the cameras and the kind of grassroots level that equipment is at right now, and, frankly, a form of distribution. It's, it's, it's a very democratized form of distribution, yeah. and it's yeah. hard to cut through the clutter, but there's nothing stopping a young filmmaker. Whatever avenue you end up following, whether it's television or film or some sort of digital medium, and they're all converging at this point anyway, there's no excuse not to be out there shooting something. It's it's your it's your it's your it's your medium. You know, just go out and do it, uh, and and eventually y you keep at it. Something appears. Somebody shows up in front of you. Do you guys notice in yourselves like things that you recognize as weaknesses as a director early on that have come to fruition now, or things that you've learned about yourself through the process, or what you learned that you're really <laughs> What did we, I, what did you say? Excuse yeah. me, possible uh, weaknesses. Just things that you, you undeniably gotten better at and recognized in yourself a, a growth. Whether it be knowing how to dialogue with the talent, or whether it be seeing things in the editing room, or the, whether the, it be the, the great thing about directing, um, and I've been very fortunate. I, I was I started very early, and I've been able to do a lot of things. The most it's it's an amazing craft. I mean, it's an unending lesson. And if I'm fortunate enough to do this, you know, until I'm old and in a wheelchair, I will continue to learn from every experience. And the great thing about it is that if you if you allow it, and if you don't go at it thinking that you have to have all the answers. It's all these amazing people that come around you every day that you show up to work who provide you the answers. Um, you know, you say, I'm here, this is where I want to be, you guys tell me how to get there. You know, I know a lot about cinematography and I know a lot about photography, but when I'm interfacing with the DP, that's what they've, he, he or she has committed their life to. I'd be a, an idiot not to, to, to really listen to what they have to say. So, um, I mean, I hope, I hope I'm getting better on every project that I ever do. Good answer. Very good answer. Do you think it was a good answer? <laughs> it was okay. Okay. <laughs> well, you, Can I be better with my answer, Tom? <laughs> yeah. You, you hit on another great, great thing that segues perfectly. Um, speaking of, of having this team around you, um, television is very different from film in terms of the director is usually the one who either gets all the praise or gets all the blame if it doesn't Ooh, work. Oh, yeah. Uh, but in TV, Directors, oftentimes, there's very few, you know, I know like shows like How I Met Your Mother have a house director, but directing, the producers and the writers are the team that is steady, and the, and the directors are rotated out. So going into, like, for example, shows that you have never written or been an actor on or you don't already know, what is that like going in? Take us through the process of getting... Hired on a show. Well, yeah, like after I did, I did Sarah's show for like four years, and then when that got canceled, and it was it, it was hard, difficult to get like another show on, and so just to pay bills, I started guest directing, and that's when I was like going, okay, well, is it, was it me or was it my DP? You know, it was like those were the. That, and so, you know, you start working on other shows, and it's a good confidence builder, but it's also very educational because everybody kind of does it differently, and you take a little bit of this, and you take a little bit of this, you work on Parks and Rec and go, oh, that's how they do it, and then you work on Children's Hospital, like, oh, that's even better, and, they, and you kind of, like, just kind of cobble together, like, this kind of Frankenstein version of what you want to be as a director, and it's, it, it, it's... It's like learning a new language each, each it, year. It really is. It is. And you just, you find yourself being more relaxed and more poised. I mean, that's the one thing, like, when I started out, I would just be, like, not be able to sleep at night and just, like, going to die and just, like, overworking storyboards and just... The thing about it is, like, when you're on set, it's, like... One one Jenga block could be pulled out, and every, all the work and storyboards and shot lists and animatics that you did can fall apart. Oh, we can't shoot in that direction now because it's the sun's this way. So now we got to throw all that out, and you just kind of learn to think on your feet really good and trust your people too. And that's that's another thing is is just like everybody underneath you is or not underneath you, but around you is is they do this you know, incredibly well, you know, they, week after week, and they know the show, so trust them, and just, just tell them, give them a point of view, this is what I want to do, and they will, they just want to be told, which direction is the bus going, you're the driver. I, it's important, because it is, um, particularly when I, when I started with going uh, to a lot of different shows, is 
there's a train that's running and you're getting on, you're getting on to sort of drive it. So you have uh, your pre-production, you have seven days to learn the personalities because every, every show has different personalities and there's different people who will really have that's your back. That's the battle, I imagine. Yeah, and, and, then, and, and then when you show up on day one of shooting, you're meeting all, you know, a whole new set of personalities, which is actual production and execution of, of what it is that you planned. But important to have sort of a vision of what it is that you want. It doesn't just, it, contrary to what people might say, <laughs> it doesn't just sort of shoot itself. Uh, you do have to, you have, do have to come at it at a certain point and be assertive enough, but also uh, open enough to allow people to feel, it, it, and it is, it's such a balance of personalities of, not being overbearing where you crush people's uh, interest in wanting to help you out or execute what you want, or sitting back, and, and I've seen directors from one spectrum to the next, sitting back and just letting the DP or other people just kind of direct it, and you're just you know calling action cut and just sort of suggesting. And, and from an acting standpoint, there's nothing worse. Uh, I knew as an actor when a director comes in who I don't know, that everyone is just looking right away and judging you, whether they're conscious of it or not, saying, is this person confident? Do they know what they want? Are they willing to be, yeah. Uh, and if you lose if you lose them on day one, oh, yeah. it's, you're, you're screwed. I always, I always say like the first like five to 10 minutes on day one of shooting, when you first meet the cast and everybody, you know, you're like, you kind of like, hey, this is the DP, like at lunch, you know, on Friday or whatever, but then you got like kind of like five, to 10 minutes to really like come in and and go this is what it's going to be you set the tone for the rest of the week i always said you had I, you know I, I i episodically directed for a long time in the last many years i've really done mostly pilots and or then run those shows that i shot the pilot on um but i always used to say when i was episodically directing you had about a morning you had about the first morning yep. and everybody there is designed is designed very much to be very pleasant and there's this hierarchy and hello Mr. Semmel and, and how are you? Would you like a Coke Mr. Semmel? Where would you like your uh, your chair Mr. Semmel? But what they really are saying is you're going to fucking tell us what to do for the next yeah. days? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's oh, yeah. your fucking Coke. Uh, and everyone, <laughs> but and everyone's saying I could do that better. Yeah, I, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, oh, yeah, like, yeah. This guy, oh yeah, he's going to do that. And then and and there's this moment yeah. where hopefully you say something or you do something you set up a shot and you sort of see everybody go whoo. Okay, cool. Because then they go, ah, we're not going to be doing 16-hour days. Well, hopefully they're going to say, oh, hey, maybe there's somebody I can actually learn from. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and funny, the, the, the thing of the healthy director's ego, while they were secretly saying, like, oh, yeah, what are you going to show us? My healthy ego was, sit back and just watch for a minute. <laughs> yeah. One thing, um, too, when you mentioned it, just meeting the cast, uh, directing in general, casting is, like, 80% of the battle, I would imagine, just film, TV, whatever the medium. But when you're going into a show with an established cast, certainly I imagine if you were coming into a show like on season three where these actors, these series regulars have been playing these people for years. Well, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of phases in making a television show. Obviously, you're, you know, you're making the pilot, you're selling the first one out. There's a lot of expectation, there's a lot of competition. You have bigger budget, you have more time. It's almost like making a little movie. Mm -hmm. And then when you're fortunate enough to get picked up a series, you then start to have to almost rebuild that. Now you know what you're trying to do, but you're trying to do it over and over and over again. For a lot less money. And for a lot less money and less time. And what happens, though, even in the course of a show that's successful, the seasons almost have different personalities to them. So that in that first season, everyone's so excited. We're at camp together, and, and we're going to go do something great. And, and really, as great as the pilot may, or may have been, you're still, you're, it's still in a formative period, a gestation period, and in that first 13. So those first 13 directors, and, and, and when I do stay with the show that I did the pilot, those first directors that I hire, it's very important because you're sort of now building it to be something that's going to go the long run. And those directors are very important. And so, you know, you try to bring people in who have either run shows or done pilots or are just very good at what they do because you're still building to that beast, yeah, you know. Sure. But then you do get to a point later on in subsequent seasons where everybody knows what they're doing. The cast have a great sense of who they're characters are and you as a director I think you come at it a little differently you, you you know you really come in it with like look you guys are awesome you do something really great here um, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm thrilled to offer my observation maybe you know I would always say to new directors coming into like American Dreams I'd basically say okay here's kind of how we do things here's our sandbox you know 
I only ask you, play nice in the sandbox. Don't throw sand out of the sandbox. Throw, don't throw sand in the other kid's eyes. And uh, have a good time and, and, and do some cool shit. And if you do something that we've never done before, like you, you build a castle that we've never seen before, I'll say, hell yeah, we'll take that into our show and we'll call that the Tom Verica Memorial Castle. And that'll be, that'll be part of our thing now, yeah. you know? And so He's it's never this, done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, but uh, no, but I mean that you... It he usually says, you're really going to shoot it like that? I don't look at his eyes. You're going to do it that way? Uh, All right. It becomes a sort of building process, and it becomes this additive thing, and it becomes, you know, more of, and it, you know, it sort of celebrates the collaborative process. So when you're giving acting notes to actors who have been playing characters for years, is there, is it more of then like a collaboration process of them that's very. It's a very delicate. Uh, yeah. It's tough. I mean, I, I as an actor, I, I, I often find from my experiences that I could kind of get a pass uh, because I'm one of one of I'm, I'm one of them. Right. Uh, but in, in all you sincerity, mean, it's just yeah, as as a director. Uh, but it, it it's so second nature to me in talking with actors. Um, I don't consciously think. I, I think initially there was a yeah, you feeling. Well, you got to yeah, say things like, "Are you really going to say it that way?" <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You look like shit from that angle. You want to turn this way? No, uh, no. That's all. I would never say that. Uh, no, but it's coming at it. You know, everything uh, that I, uh, as an actor, uh, everything is kind of, uh, I come at it as, as an active, everything is active in my uh, approach to the work I do as an actor and also as a director when I'm talking to actors. And I, I find oftentimes with uh, director friends of mine who, who don't know or who are trying to find that elusive you know, key to dealing with actors is, um, you know, because that's the thing that fears most directors, I think, who haven't acted, is what to say to them, and are they going to re, you know, you know, because the worst thing you want to hear as an actor is, can you cry here, or yeah. I think, I think you just got to be mad, you know, th those are things that aren't really, and as an actor, you immediately say, okay, I got to cut this off and sort of take care of myself here about how, how I'm going to come at it, so it's getting in there, and, and then also, which you guys both, I'm sure, can attest to, is that there's, Every actor is different. Some want to be spoken to after every take. Others want to be left alone. Uh, there was a show that I worked on just last uh, a year or two ago, where I was told the lead actress doesn't want any direction. She just doesn't. And I was like, that's, that's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's absurd. But they said no, they don't want to be talked to. And, and um, so and right away, I kind of um, I took that as a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to talk to her. <laughs> Uh, and I just made a subtle little suggestion about something, and uh, by the end of the first day, she was really encouraging and wanted to hear kind of what I thought of, uh, you know, what, what wanted to know if am I getting what I want. And so it was a very different, and, and I think you really have to sort of approach each situation. You have to almost be like a, a, a psychologist as you approach each individual person and their personalities in, in, in doing that. But uh, the largest thing I think that people are intimidated is dealing with actors and particularly personalities. I remember after American Dreams, I went into my first uh, show outside of American Dreams, outside of the family that I knew was Boston Legal. And I had uh, William Shatner and James Spader, who were two very big personalities <laughs> and very intimidating walking into a, a new crew and two guys who have clear opinions. Uh, and it, at complete opposite ends of the spectrum as, as, as uh, their work ethic is concerned. So, it, uh, there are stories. Yeah, like everybody has to be in the same show. Yes. And I think that's... A, that's and it's your job to sort of adapt and sort yeah, of say, how, how do I sort of develop my relationship yeah. with this particular actor in a way that they, they... But, you know, it's also at the end of the day, actors by their nature... Uh, I don't even want to say they're insecure. I mean, I think part of the process of being an actor is knowing that you're giving over to, to you know, on a performance and that you're, you, you know, I, I think actors need to be held accountable to being professional. If you, you do hold them to accountable, most of them will rise to that challenge. And being accountable is knowing the fact that they're a cog in a larger wheel, and if they have any salt at all, they actually want input. So, yeah, I can't I, remember I, I, the, the show you're talking about. I'm sure you told me about it at the time, but I just shake my head at that. I mean, I know where that comes from. It comes from the fact, frankly, in some ways, the question you were acting about, well, also that directors are coming through, and it's hard. We giving have, line readings and stuff. like. Well, some people don't know what... Some people are better than others, let's put it that yeah. way. And, and, and for an actor, there is an insecurity that comes with, oh my God, eight, each eight days there's somebody else I have to you know, get used to. And so I don't, I don't love the knee-jerk reaction being, I don't want to talk to the director. It's, it's, I get it. It's like, look, they're, they're, 
uncertain. So. You, you have to you have to earn the trust, really. Before, I mean, and I think like what 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 you did is just kind of like slowly give a slight suggestion instead of like ramming in like like this. That. I mean, like there's different like different. Every actor is different. Like on, on Silverman, we worked with like Brian Posehn and Steve Agee. Like these guys are stand-ups. They're not traditionally trained actors, so you can go up to it and go. Come on, rat, speed it up, guys. You know this, this show's only twenty-one. He's talk faster. No one put pauses. You, you mean you can't really do that with other actors? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you, know, you, get, you, you know, I mean, like you you go like like Chris Messina on on uh, uh, Mindy Project, who is. He'll say himself, I'm not a comedy actor. I'm, I'm a dr dramatic actor who does comedy. I just attack everything from the truth, which I love, because I think that's what comedy really is, is, is truth. And so, uh, and I was told right away, uh, like, you know, like the people that go, he does not like to be told, speed it up. And, uh, but he's a guy that needs to be told to speed it up. But, but you just like, if you find a way to attack it, to, to, you know, and you having discussions about emotion and things like that, and things that are important, things that you, that are important to the scene, important to the comedy, uh, it, Naturally, he'll like go. You know what I should do? I should probably talk faster with this, right? Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> we, yeah, we got the slow one. Let's shoot a fast one. Mark the fast one, please. Um, speaking of comedy, you've done a lot of comedy and a lot of different comedies. Is there a specific challenge with like a joke that's on the page that's working or worked in a read and and trying to translate those? To Absolutely. Yeah. How do you navigate that, or, or, or speaking like actors who are comedians versus? Well, the thing the thing about it is like especially when when you have a cast of funny people and you just say, "Make me laugh." I'm a laugher. Okay. Like when I when I direct, I'm I'm like you know like I'll I'll cover my mouth or whatever. I also an audience member. I too. audience member. I I like try to be encouraging because you know that that works with me when 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 people give me positive stuff. I, I work better when I'm loved. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so pathetic. Hug him after. Hey, Rob. Rob, you're doing fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> right, and we start you. dancing. Uh, but but you know I think like not only uh, do you wanna you wanna like give adjustments but you also should encourage. Courage, you know, like that was a great take, and be tr not. You can't just like go, oh my God, tears every single time. You gotta be. I mean, like they need to trust you in the sincerity because they don't know what what's going on behind the screen, uh, be uh, on the screen until like sometimes when it's on TV. They don't know what they look like. They don't know where they are at, and so you wanna make them feel like I'm here to take care of you. I'm here to make you look good and and also being an editor as well as a director, you want to go if you say it like this and you turn away at that moment, it's you're going to kill that really important line because I'm going to have to cut it. And like when I say like things like speed it up, you know, don't put these pauses in there because every time you take like a big pause, I'm going to have to cut to him to to speed you up. Either you speed up or I'm gonna speed you Manipulation up. Manipulation is beautiful. Yeah, so you'll get more screen time if you talk faster. How about that? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, like that's that's what you, you want to say, but you can't. I mean, it's it's. I mean, if you have like a relationship, like I did with Sarah, you can you can do that. Because she'll be in the edit room back on. Oh my God, Ooh, let's talk faster. I was like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Do you have, um, this for each one of you, do you have a specific episode that you directed or a moment in an episode that you're particularly proud of for a specific reason that you can think of off the top of your head? I'll, I'll, tell, a, I'll tell a great moment from American Dreams. <laughs> do it. And it involves my good friend Tom. <laughs> so we were, uh, John Prince, who's uh, actually going to be in the festival later, we're, you know, we're doing a panel for the show. Um, we had a moment where we were early on in the show, it was beloved by Jeff Zucker, who was at running the network at the time. And we had an early, one of the, uh, I can't remember what season it was, but we had a, a show that he watched, called me and Jonathan, said he loved the episode. There was one bit that um, he just, he knew we locked picture, I'm sure you guys all know what that means, and it was already in the process of starting to be posted, or you know, all the finishing work, and, uh, but he just was, he sort of said, it's too bad, this one thing would have been great if you did this. We hung up the phone, and, and meanwhile, it was a 99% incredible uh, notes call, but we heard that 1%. 
And Jonathan and I looked at each other and, and, and he was like, how would you fix this? And I was like, well, wouldn't we do something like this? And he looked at me and he said, well, I could write the scene that took place in the, um, the TV uh, shop. And I was like, hang on a second. And I grabbed the call sheet and I looked at it and they were shooting in the, in the TV shop. And I said to Jonathan, uh, how long do you think you could take to write that scene? He's like, I'll write it in 15 minutes. Uh -huh. And 15 minutes later, and I called down to the set and I said, hey guys, where are you on the day? They were a little bit ahead. I said, I'm gonna come down and pick up a scene with Tom and, and Matt Armstrong, who played the brother. Mm -hmm. Jonathan wrote me the script, and uh, I, I looked at it, it's fantastic. I said, I'm gonna go down and shoot it. We went down and shot it. Uh, we cut it. Mm -hmm. uh, your sister cut it. Uh, <laughs> the next morning, uh, we had it sitting on Jeff Zucker's desk. Wow. And basically said like, uh, is that what you were talking about? <laughs> And he said yes, and we put it. But the great thing about it was, what, what's even better um, is that, and it was such a, it was such a, it, it's, it's a moment that I think about all the time because everybody, and this is what was so great about American Dreams, everybody was participating, everybody, everybody was on it, and what, and what happened was, it was this great scene where Tom's character was running for, uh, were you running for city council, something like that, and uh, he wasn't getting, he was, he was, he was doing something that was. P pissing off the, the, the priest at, the, at their church, and he needed his vote. His brother, who was sort of this ne'er-do-well cop, had come in, was giving him the sort of right act about why he wasn't going to get elected. And as we typically did in our scenes, it wasn't just what the scene's about. We, were always, we would always take a pass at, well, it, this is what the scene's about. Sure, what are they doing? Because you know our attitude was always like, people don't sit and talk about things. They, they do stuff, and they have conversations. And so we decided that Pete was going to come in with a couple sandwiches from the hoagie shop. And they were going to be, he was going to bring them lunch. So they're going through lunch. And uh, part, of the, uh, part of the text of the dialogue was not just about Pete giving him a hard time about not um, doing what he needed to do to get the vote from the church. He, he was pissed off because of the sandwich wasn't what he wanted. So embedded in the dialogue, he's telling Tom all this stuff, and he's, and he's like, he's like um, uh, you know, uh, you, you got to do this to get the vote. Why does, people, oh, you know, why does Jimmy always put these onions on my sandwich? And, and he's going out with the dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. And this was not in the script. And Tom's sitting there trying to eat his sandwich. And, and the last thing the actor, Matt, did was he got fed up at the end of the scene and he buttoned the scene by just going over and grabbing Tom's sandwich and eating it. <laughs> and it made the scene great. Yeah. But it was this just sort of like... It, everybody, everybody, everybody's working together. And everybody, it was, it was an, it, one of the great things about American Dreams is that everybody felt encouraged to participate. Mm -hmm. That there was never a wrong... It, there was, it was always encouraged that anybody... We always believed a great idea could come from anybody. And because everybody's head was so in the same place, moving in the same direction, as I always said, everybody had their oars in the water, rowing in the same direction, that great stuff just came out of it. And that was just a really yeah. Cool you just have to kind of be liquid and go with the with the flow because I mean, like when you you can have like a great scene, great dialogue, great ideas that are really, really, truly great, like you know, months prior in in the script, and then when you're on this on the set and the cameras are there and it's just not working, you have to figure out how to make it work. Like I remember we did uh, uh, the scene uh, in Mindy Project where Mindy came on, on the set and she's like, this scene isn't funny. And just kind of looked at everybody like, how are you going to make it funny? <laughs> and we all went, uh, and then and we just like started bringing stuff in, the prop department said, well, we need some bean bags over here, we'll do this, and somebody yes. could throw a piece of paper, and just completely rewrote the scene, like... Everybody had ownership of the movie. Yeah, because it, it was like a scene which was just gonna be, you know, just like a wide and cross cover, and we'll be out of here, and you know, and it, and we, it, it was like one of those panic moments where you're just like, uh, I didn't plan for this at all. But you just kind of go, yes, 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 yes. It's like improv. If you've done any kind of improv scene, like the key is not to deny, not to ask questions, just say yes and. And that's what being a director is, is kind of is, is just like going, okay, yeah, we can do that. What if we did this? What if we did this? Give, give options, pick the, the best, easiest, uh, timely choice, and, and just do it. And uh, it, it's great. When that happens, it's, it's really magic. It's when, I mean, we say, you know, we often, sometimes we say when mistakes happen, they're, they're great things. Happy accidents. Oh, yeah. But I, I think that you, you kind of create that palette for a happy accident. I think if you're... Yeah. 
That's exactly right. I mean, you, you come in with a plan, um, and you know what it is that you want to achieve and feel confident enough that you'll get there, but really have to think on your feet and be spontaneous in the moment, exactly what you're talking about. And you might see something. There, there's a couple times that I'll, I'll see a prop or, or a set piece or something saying, you know what, what if it took place over here? Yeah. And maybe you're doing something like this. Now, it's not scripted, and... You know, sometimes you come back and say, what the fuck were you doing that for? Yeah, yeah. A writer says, you screwed my seat. Yeah. What are they doing? No, but I think that's part of what we do is, as, yeah. as the collaborators, uh, whether it's the actors and, and the DP who might even see, suggest something, is that you're open to those, uh, what I call seeing the field, that is that you can sort of just uh, look, look at everything and just sort of look at the overall and say, how is this going to play? Is this achieving what... I want emotionally out of the scene, or is this getting what I want, or how do we enhance it? Is this detracting to my plan for what I wanted to do? Is it upstaging sort of what's really it about? And sometimes you do. You strip away and you take down, and you just let it just play. Sometimes it's just so beautiful, just as, as simple as it can be. So it's really allowing those uh, moments to sort of play themselves out, and, and you basically are doing that when you're watching rehearsal and staging it. I once had a producer tell me very early on to, when I was preparing to do, a, you know, direct, uh, make notes, do shot lists, do sketches, do schematics, um, just go crazy with that kind of stuff. Anything I could think of to do, to break down a script in any way. And then when I got to the set, throw all that away. Oh, yeah. And then assume that your intention now through going through that process. It's like, you know, memorizing lines as an actor, yeah. writing them down because you're you're writing it and it's it's, it's but that all that preparation work you have you Trust you have to have the confidence that it's in your yeah. DNA. And so that way if you're not saying, well you, you know you're supposed to go over there and you should you should stand over there for this line, what you're actually doing is you're looking at what's happening and you're looking at what the sun's bringing you and you're looking at what uh, the prop guy happens to bring you or the DP or the actors or what kind of oatmeal is being served this morning. And it's all somehow you know that it's coming and it was for you. And you know it's it's um, He loves oatmeal. Tom Tom had a thing about oatmeal. Uh, but you know that it's all being filtered through your DNA. And that that you, that it, it enables you, as Tom says, to play the you know see the field and take what works for you, and you know because really you're in many ways, and I think maybe why I like editing so much is as your director you're kind of an editor. Yeah. Everybody's bringing you stuff all day long, and it's your job, and I think it's your responsibility to to uh, joyfully take the things that they brought you that are great and add to the project project and respectfully deny the things that don't work. Because if you do it respectfully, they'll continue to bring you things. You know, they'll feel comfortable about bringing you things and not worry that you're gonna say, what the hell is that? You know what I mean? Yeah, nobody, nobody likes feeling that they are not doing a good job. Right. The more you, you can encourage everybody uh, from, you know, like just like knowing the names of everybody on your, on your team and just like, oh, hey, Bill, can you give me up in there? And yeah, you know, that was great or no thanks, but maybe, you know, I mean, like if you are very respectful to everybody, everybody's gonna work so much better, you know, because you hear about like these directors that shout and scream and call people idiots and, and stuff. They're, 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 they're self-destructing their own project because if somebody did that to me, I'd go, well, fuck you, man. I'm not going to do 100%. Here's your damn oatmeal. Yeah. <laughs> we, you, 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 Enjoy the special surprise at the bottom. <laughs> you hit on two important things there, I think. It, there's no doubt you have to have creativity uh, as a director, but you really, if you don't have that leadership DNA, I think that is also it, almost as equally important as the creative aspect of it. Um, so, I mean, it, it's very clear that, uh, you know, oftentimes, and I think you said this, Rob, that the actors won't even see what it looks like until it airs, and sometimes they won't even see the episode. Yeah. A lot of times they'll just never see it because they shoot so much. Yeah. Um, so oftentimes, if you can create, I would imagine, the experience is what they will remember more than the product. You know, because they may never even see it, but they will remember shooting it for those eight days with you or whoever's on set. That just reminded me one of the, one of the in fact, it was that short that I did, uh, first one, but it, it, having that sort of, uh, you know what you where you want to get to there was this actor who had who was just fighting me on everything he was one of those actors who just no matter what you said he was he, he was contrary and he was threatening this uh, this other actor that he was op acting opposite of and he had this bag of things and he wanted to hold up this hammer and I said well maybe maybe we don't need one let's try one without the hammer that you're holding up so it's not so on the nose and maybe it's just through your your, the tone of your voice and everything. He's like, no, if I give you one, you're gonna use that one. So he's really kind of fighting me. 
uh, a lot of ways. And it's, you know, and, and uh, as an actor, I know that, you know, when a director says, well, let's try one with that, and I gotta know that either I, I gotta wrap myself around and embrace that, uh, or don't do it, because they're, they're, they will use that take. But I knew, uh, I, I just knew that this moment was not about that, and this actor was really fighting me on that. So I did something that, uh, that this actor came up to me uh, after the screening and totally saw it and was like, I said, make sure you hold it out there then. And I, had, I went to the camera and said, give me a nice yeah. tight close up. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, because I said, that's the only way I'm gonna have that option because I wanted to see the option. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe when I cut it together, he was right about that. But, but he, he, wouldn't, he just wouldn't go, he wasn't collaborating. He wasn't being, uh, he wasn't playing. He wasn't being, and he came up to me after the screening and said, you know, it was just real, he was a real kind of bristly kind of guy. He says, you know, you fucking fought me on that thing, but you were right, you were right. <laughs> and it was a little bit, it wasn't like, yeah, fuck you kind of thing, but it was just like, just, it, it, I'll, I'll respect, I'll, I'll try whatever it is you want to try, but you got to uh, trust that me looking from outside, looking in, that it, it's, it's a different thing. And I, I can see things that I know you may think is, is perfect and beautiful, but it may not translate to what really we're trying to do is, is in the whole thing. Um, I think it's, we, it's about time for some audience Q&A. Oh, look at that, right here. Yeah, Dave, I think maybe this question is directed more to you, no offense guys, but I think you had some uh, experience with uh, pilots and, and kind of uh, the creation of shows and, 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 uh, and, and I'm curious what you guys think uh, about the role of spirituality in television uh, you know, the history of the Bible, you know, broke all the records, 13.6 million viewers for cable. Where do you see television in the future? Do you see, uh, you, you know, the movement towards that with spirituality? And just, you know, what's your take on that? Well, I think ultimately television, uh, hopefully, is a reflection of our society. And our society is, you know, is, is pretty complex and has lots of twists and turns and has a lot of movements in it, but there is kind of a through line. Um, and I'm actually really, frankly, pretty excited about television right now. Um, there's, there's, there's more thoughtful, you know, I mean, you know, spirituality could also be, I think, translated to just thoughtful dialogue and conversation and meaningful interrelationship between characters and not just sort of, you know, hardware visual effects blowing up. Um, right. And I think the kind of um, interpersonal stories that are being told and the types of relationships that are really being delved into uh, as the universe of television gets bigger and bigger is really encouraging and very exciting. And it was really kind of what it was meant to be. Do you know what I mean? It's a place where people can meet. You know, one of the things that we always really loved about American Dreams was that people, more than anything I've ever done, people would come to me afterwards that I didn't know and say, you know, thank you so much for making a show that I can actually sit and watch with my family and actually have conversations with my kids about afterwards. Um, and it just feels like we're, television is allowing that to uh, occur more and more than ever before. Can I, can I take that yeah. for a quick one? Uh, when I first started do, doing uh, where I would run a show after I directed the pilot, uh, there were some other guys that I had worked for who, were, who had done that before. I'd gone and guest directed for them. And it was a really great, it was great pleasure for me to bring them in as directors on my show. And I remember saying one to one of them after I was doing it for a little while, I was like, God, you know, it's really interesting. I do these shows. And now I'm watching all the episodes of the show, and it's my good friend Bill, or it's my good friend Jimmy, or it's my good friend whoever who are now coming in to direct. And I said, you know what I'm finding that's really interesting? I'm watching an episode, and it looks exactly like American Dreams. But you know what? Bill's got this really funny sense of humor, and Bill's episode had this kind of funny sense of humor to it. And this other episode, it absolutely feels like an episode of American Dreams, but Jimmy directed, and he was kind of, he's a little bit more formal. He puts a suit on when he goes to work, and it's got a little bit more of a structure to it. And my friend said to me, well, you know, if you have any salt as a director, as an episodic director, you're going in to recreate what somebody else has created, and you, and you want to stay within what the show is. It's a covenant that's been created with the audience, right? But if you're worth your salt at all, if there's any of an artist in you, you are going to inevitably leave something of you behind. And that just kind of naturally happens. It's just, it's inevitable. If you have any kind of a point of view, if you go in intending to do that show, 
you're going to end up bringing a little bit of who you are. I was going to say, you, you, if you have a strong point of view, you understand, yeah. the, you, you understand the rules and parameters of what you're playing, but you look for your... And, and it's a delicate thing. It's, it's not wanting to just do something different with the camera that will bump and change because it's not what the show does. But there's a real way in, in just in how you approach it. And there, it it's, it's subtle things. And it's some things that you uh, oftentimes don't plan. It's just it's kind of how you sort of approach. There may be a character that you identify with more than what no, normally is. And you're able to sort of, or getting performances. You know, you, you will, if you have a strong point of view going in about how you want to tell that story and really understand and approach each scene, uh, you inevitably are going to leave your mark in what your sort of vision is. It's like singing a song, you know, like the Star Spangled Banner. Everybody, you know, sings the song differently, but, you know, Whitney sings it this way up here and Frank sits it this way or whatever. You know, I mean, like, I, I think a, a lot of it has to do with rhythm, too, you know, like, because... Uh, I, I like to just make sure things kind of rhythmically work so I can push that more in the edit and, and because comedy especially, and I'm sure like drama and like, you know, action and, and, and horror stuff is, is, it's all about rhythm. If it feels right, uh, it's working. So There's pitfalls about trying to sort of change the yeah. thing or, or leave your mark and, and that's you where you can that, really like, get into problems. Park, Parks and Rec. You couldn't do do the stuff that you that I was doing on the Sarah Silverman program because it's a different vocabulary. It's like, it's like knowing their vocabulary but you know the rhythm is different. That's that's it. But personality goes a long way. Um, I was just curious about uh, dealing with the writers, especially if you come out as a, de a guest director, because you may be coming out season three. Some of these writers may have been there from the pilot. Um, they're the ones that are kind of crafting the arcs and the stories, but you guys are coming to tell this one part of the story. Do you guys have any um, issues ever dealing with writers on set? <laughs> <laughs> Never. It's so harmonious all the time. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, uh, I mean, like, you, with a show like with, like Mindy, which is its first season, and, and I directed one of the first, like, four, they were still kind of figuring out them, uh, uh, what they were doing, but they're all, like, great writers, uh, so I, I learned to trust them and, and help them as much as I could, like, I would go through the the script and I would say, you know, if you do this, if you end your first act like this and then you begin your second act after a commercial in the same place, it kind of feels like the show's not going anywhere. Could you move this? Some? And, and they listen to that and and they're, they're happy to adjust while you're in pre-production. And it's always like just a suggestion, you know, coming at it from it's your show, but this is just from my experience when you, in the edit, you're going to be wishing that we did this instead of that. So um, most of the time they're open to that. Other times... There's an inherent... Uh, the reality is there's an inherent conflict between a writer and a director. It just exists. A writer doesn't think of nothing when he's writing the words. He's not, see, he's not, not seeing something in his head. Uh, there are some guys who are more very specific about what they're seeing, and there are guys, you know, men and women who write to varying degrees with specificity. Some people are just wordsmiths, and that's all they care about. I worked with Aaron Sorkin. He has no sensibility um, towards uh, the visuals. I've never come across a guy who has a stronger sense of his dialogue. And he would come down in rehearsal, and all he would do is he would almost, I think he would close his eyes, and he would listen, and he would only comment would be either to me or the actors, you know, this is really important, this part of the rhythm, you guys are great, and he'd leave. I mean, he had nothing to say about the visual content. That's not to say he didn't appreciate it, but that's not what he did. David Kelly, very similar, you know, just real wordsmiths. And then there are other guys who have uh, uh, stronger sensibilities of how it's going to look, and frankly, different degrees of uh, talent in, in, in how it looks. You know, there's some guys who are great writers and are great visualists, and there's some guys who are great writers and are not particularly good visualists. And part of the job is figuring out how to incorporate their needs, but you're the director. You're the director. That's and with that goes doing. challenges. I mean, it is, you know, you hope to, to develop a relationship with, or that someone brings you in as a director to trust what you're going to do with their show, that you're good enough to do. But it exists. There's people who have writers on set who might try to micromanage everything you do. And, well, that's not how I envisioned it. I, I thought for sure they'd be, you know, there has been occasion where, you know, well, I didn't think they'd be 
sitting down here or moving here, you know, and mm -hmm. those are the things, again, you have to uh, let a writer know that I, I understand that that may have been, but this is, the, this is kind of what's happening. This is the dynamic that's happening right now. And unless it's something that's really kind of bumping as to where it's going to go, but I, I oftentimes find when I go into a new situation or uh, in my current situation, I just go to the writer right away and just start developing that relationship because it's not, I don't want it to be contrary. I want to say, hey, help me understand what it is that you're trying to get right. here. And if there's something big that I'm trying to do, if there's something, if, I, if I'd like to place it in a different place that, that it's, it's uh, scripted, sometimes there'll be, no, actually, it's got to stay here because it's going to track to something later. Or, shit, I like, I like that. That's kind of cool. Yeah, go with that. So it's really, I, I don't want to wait for that moment where I'm on set to surprise a writer about what it is if there's something that I'm thinking that's a little outside the box, I'll go to them and sort of pick their brain and say, hey, I'm kind of thinking about this thing. You know, what? Talk to me a little bit about the scene about what it is that you, you want to protect or, or, or are you pretty much open to, to me taking my stab at it? And, and the, the standing up, sitting down always blows my mind. He's, he's, <laughs> how, come he's, how come he's sitting in this scene? I uh, was wanted to stand. Was, well, it says in the script he's, uh, he's supposed to be standing. Uh, all right. Uh, could you stand up? <laughs> Show saved! <laughs> now it's hilarious. Thank you. I mean, like, sometimes I mean, they focus on, sometimes there's a focus just on what, what is on the um, Exactly. On the it's like, it's, uh, it, and, and you want to you wanna say, like, okay, yes, you wrote the joke, and you did a great job, and your job was to make the script really good, but now I have to tell the joke, and I have to tell the joke through this guy, this guy, this person over here, and like yeah. this, and it's got to look right, and the reason that person is standing is because the composition, I'm not going to go through it, just roll, shoot it, okay? <laughs> you know, uh, you, you want to do that, but you can't do that, so... Um, uh, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's across the bear. Uh, one more question. Let's see, right there. Um, this is for David. In your Homeland episode, I was wondering, um, it, that's an amazing episode, I'm sure you know that. It's a great episode, <laughs> yeah. But um, could you discuss a decision you make in that episode, or maybe perhaps what you struggled with, maybe um, perhaps what you wanted to tell me? Um, at the very end? Yeah. Well, uh, he, well, actually, you know what? Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a very good story about that. Uh, Do you want to s briefly say what episode you directed? I, I directed the episode where, actually, the, the Carrie finally revealed to Brody that she knew... New Car was, Smell, is that another? New Car Smell, yeah. That uh, he... Anybody here an Academy member? No. <laughs> uh, that uh, she, that she sort of turned the tables on him, and he was uh, arrested. You know, he was, he was bagged and tagged as it were. But um, at the very end of the show, when the scene in the hotel that you're referring to, uh, I started shooting it um, a little bit more traditionally, handheld. I mean, we rehearsed it, and it, it was clear that it was just this very intense scene. And um, I started laying off a little bit and just letting it play, um, thinking that the intensity was there. And because I, I, I tend to sort of try to set things up to let the actors feel um, as little imposition from a film crew as possible, that, it, that it's really all about them. Um, and uh, it wasn't feeling as intense as it should have. And the DP, to his credit, who we'd known each other, we'd almost worked together a couple times, didn't happen, and we had a really great time working together on this, he said to me, can I try something? And I said, sure. He said, you know, what? we've had really good success on this show. And this speaks to a show that started, has really kind of figured out its own language. Um, he said, you know, uh, you know, I don't know if this is getting too technical for you guys, but he said, let me, get, let me put on a short lens and get handheld and get right up in their faces. And I said, yeah, let's try it. And we did one take, and it was unbelievable. And I, uh, I realized in that moment that's where this show lives. That it, it, that it gives it that sense of verisimilitude and you're right in the characters' faces and those actors were so used to that. It was almost weird to them at first when the cameras were farther back and out of their face a little bit. Um, and I ended up, it was early enough in the shooting of that episode that I ended up really doing a lot of the episode like that because I really realized, wow, I get it. This is where this show works. So, you know, as long as I've been doing it, I'm always open to learning new tricks and it was great. That's all the time we have, unfortunately. Thank you guys so much. And thank you for the great questions.